Our white enemies aren't going to give up on taking the major cities back from us. Some of you think when they retreated to the suburbs, they were running away. Not at all. It was merely a strategic fallback. A safe place where they could plan their reconquest of the inner city. Now, some of you think because Detroit has an 85% black population and Newark a 55% black population and New Orleans a 68% black population that the whites will simply fume and rage but ultimately accept that blacks have them woefully outnumbered and that is that. But have they left your city alone? Or are they still trying to use gentrification to expel the blacks from the city the same way they did in Miami? Right now, the good white folks in Wayne County are letting the blacks stew in their own juices. The whites have Detroit surrounded, not like a group of neighbors, but like an army waiting for the order to invade. This is ethnic cleansing, American style. But it's only a taste of what Detroit is in for if they don't make some rapid changes. Make no mistake, the Whites are planning to retake Detroit, the same way they've begun the reconquest of New Orleans, Newark, Baltimore, Gary, Indiana, and anywhere else where Blacks have set up shop. And when they do retake it, they intend to leave the Blacks broke, homeless, and destitute. Kind of like they did in another major Black city. And what are the black leaders of Detroit doing while all this is going on? Are they improving the conditions of Detroit's residents so they can stand on their own two feet and resist the economic war that's coming? Or are they preoccupied with something else? Folks, we are all Detroiters now. That means we are all in trouble. And unless we get serious about what we want, unless you lay out an agenda in no uncertain terms at the grassroots, one that white people didn't create or control, then we are all going to go the way of the Motor City. I made that video four years ago. Well, it's 2013, and as I told you, the racists have taken Detroit lock, stock, and barrel, and they didn't even bother to wait until the blacks had left. The whites realized that they already had a statewide majority, so they used that to implement a blatantly fascist takeover of the cities they were unable to win in an election. And it's neither an accident nor a surprise that the only cities that are being taken over by the state are the black ones. I saw 13 years ago that the Republicans had stopped trying to actually win elections. They realized America was leaving them behind. So they started looking for ways to seize office without having to get 50.1% of the vote. Next thing we know, the Supreme Court is deciding who's president, and right-wing business interests are overthrowing California's governor with a recall election. Because in a recall election, you don't have to get 50.1% of the vote. All you have to get is a numerical plurality. The problem was that even these extreme and blatantly unconstitutional schemes didn't solve the Republicans' main problem. That there simply aren't enough white males left for them to win national office anymore. And increasingly, not enough left for them to win state office either. So now they're attempting to turn every Republican state into its own little banana republic. Or should I say its own little apartheid. And Detroit was to be their test case. Now you understand why the concept of so-called states' rights has become so precious to them. Now you understand why they keep saying that, as they see it, the individual states are countries unto themselves, able to enact laws independent of the federal government or even the Constitution. In Michigan, states' rights has taken the form of the state initiating a hostile takeover of specifically targeted cities. Now, the right-wingers will try to say the emergency manager was the will of the people, but that's a lie, because when the Republicans put the idea of an emergency manager on the state ballot, the people of Michigan voted it down. That's right. The people of Michigan voted against the plan to have so-called emergency managers. Everyone could see that this was a poorly disguised grab for power by the Republicans, who were obviously trying to manufacture a so-called law to take over cities they couldn't win in an election. But the Republican governor, 
supported by his Republican legislature, totally trampled the will of the people, implementing a set of laws which replicated the emergency manager scheme that the voters had rejected. Both I and Black Authority told you that Detroit was the target of this law. For years we had given you the play-by-play -play chronicling how white supremacy was creeping up on the Motor City to gobble it whole. Having failed to take the power of the vote from black people, the Republicans decided to take the political power from the black people's elected officials. The people of Detroit can still vote, but now it's their representatives who are under state-sanctioned house arrest. They cannot enact any regulations, carry out any city functions, can't enter into any contracts, or even hold a city council meeting for that matter. And once the state has taken a city hostage, there's no way to force them out. They don't have to relinquish control of the city until they get ready to, which won't be until after they've stripped it of all civil rights, all economic protections, and all opportunities for non-whites. As I said years ago, this is ethnic cleansing, American style. They have nullified the citizens' vote while still taking those same citizens' tax money and what was left of their future. This is an entirely new form of white supremacy on the march. New, but not surprising. The intelligent among us saw this coming years ago. A lot of black people didn't want to believe white people would go this far, but some of us, who are willing and able to see the world the way it truly is, understood long ago that there's nothing you can put past these people. Even if the people of Detroit tried, they can't put pressure on the Republican politicians at the state level because they have redrawn the district lines in such a way as to ensure that no matter how numerous the black vote is, it will always be corralled into a few minor districts. This way, black representation can be made artificially lower than it really is. Welcome to American apartheid. But Detroit was only the beginning. It's no coincidence that during his regime, W began front-loading the Supreme Court with as many right-wing zealots as he could. After all, it was the Supreme Court that handed him a presidency that he didn't actually win. The unreconstructed Confederates on the Supreme Court began celebrating months ago how they were going to take down the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Antonin Scalia, sounding like the racist punk he's always been, issued statements that sounded like something Karl Rove would say. He boldly proclaimed that it was his job to enforce political agendas from the bench. And the Chief Justice, John Roberts, who in the 1980s, as a member of the Reagan administration, tried to eliminate the Voting Rights Act, using the same arguments that he used 30 years ago, that the times had changed. Well, the times may change, but these people don't. The lie that Chief Justice Roberts tried to use in 2013 was that the South was no more racist than the North. This is the old, we're all a little bit racist meme. Roberts also went on to defend his make-believe rationale by saying Massachusetts had a worse record on minority voting than Mississippi. Well, Massachusetts Secretary of State William F. Galvin refuted that and used Roberts' own data to do it. So we see that this isn't about the facts or even reality. It's about the sick power desires of white supremacy. John Roberts had no legal justification for his ruling. He just made it up as he went along, creating totally fictitious terms that have no meaning in order to justify an action that had no legality. And we know that this was a concerted effort, because within moments of the Supreme Court having crippled the Voting Rights Act, we saw the GOP-controlled state legislatures immediately take full advantage of the fact that there is now no federal oversight of how they draw the voting districts. Think about that. These same state legislatures take months, if not years, to argue over economic measures or vote for educational or health care reform. Virtually all the state legislatures have been in perpetual gridlock for years now. But when it came time to reintroduce 21st century Jim Crow, it took them less than two hours to bring out some spanking new laws. That lets you know what the Republican politicians consider to be their top priority. As I said years ago, the whites have Detroit surrounded, like an army waiting for the order to invade, which the Supreme Court has now given. 
and they've made no bones about the fact that their entire agenda is to completely eliminate any black representation. Neutralizing the black politicians' legal powers was only the first step. The real goal has always been to ensure that black people cannot vote. When I posted this video years ago, I had a lot of white people who said that this was all a lie, just extremist rhetoric. I would sure like to hear from them good white folks now. As black people, we have been politically ignorant and economically foolish. The result? Our enemies, all of them, are giving us death by a thousand cuts. Dismantling the Voting Rights Act was just step one. Black people have utterly failed to learn a basic truth about democracy. The only politician you can trust is the one you paid for. If all you bring to the table are votes, that simply isn't enough. This world runs on money, and we don't have any. This must change. The time for black people to play is over. In fact, it was over 150 years ago, and we failed to accept it. Black people can no longer afford to think it's cute to be the dumbest person in the room. Stop thinking that our leaders are supposed to shuck and jive for us. Stop wanting leaders who we think keep it real, because they do keep it real, real dumb. We need to learn what our interests are and then defend them to the death. Hair weave, sporting events, and the new LeBrons are not our interests. We must start thinking and acting for ourselves again. Black people can no longer indulge the immature fantasy that ghetto life is just another way to live. It is the first step toward genocide. Corral the undesirables into poor, dirty hovels and then eliminate them at your leisure. It is game over for acting in ways the white media has told you to. It's also time for black people to get serious. Being an intelligent black man cannot merely be a matter of color. It must also be a club, an exclusive club. And a club has two defining features. It has a select membership, and it has rules. The price of admission is that you demonstrate that you own things. The membership dues are that you conduct your business with other black people. But we cannot make being black into a club until first we see value in being black. And right now, being black is a club that nobody wants to belong to, not even blacks themselves. This must change. You must see being black as a valuable prize to be fought for in order to preserve it. I'm not talking about merely fighting for a color. I'm talking about fighting for a way of life. Speaking of which, there must also be a code of conduct that goes along with it. The self-destructive ghetto behavior the media has promoted amongst us must be completely rooted out and rejected. We are men, and as such we think for ourselves. The media took criminal culture, uneducated culture, and told us that this was our culture. We didn't do that. They did. But what we did do was to accept the lie that they told us. We took an identity handed to us by our enemies and rejected our African selves. Now we are so weak and confused, we can't defend ourselves against what is clearly the beginning of a genocide. The world had largely forgotten what white supremacy was, but we're getting a hard reminder now, aren't we? White supremacy in the past annihilated entire races of people, and now it is here for us. The white man has more power than he ever had before, and not surprisingly he is using that power to snuff out lives on an unimaginable scale. He is devastating the planet's very ability to sustain human life. White power no longer means black destruction. It now means global extinction, and having seen the wealth that he stole and, and the opulent lifestyle he created for himself, the whole world now wants to follow in the white man's self-destructive footsteps. This is what we're up against. The African, the father of humanity, represents the world's last best hope. He is the only one who still has enough sense to resist the white man's pernicious, corrupting influence. The question now is, does he also have the willpower to do so? To turn the tide, the black man will have to find within himself once again the strength to reunite all the disparate sons of Africa under one banner, with one agenda. Whether it be the halls of government, 
business or academics. We must want, no, need to see black people in charge of these institutions and to see them led by an African value system. This is why knowledge of self is so important. A man without an identity only has the ability to be one thing, a servant of others. A man who knows who he is isn't willing to serve anyone or even be a partner for that matter. For the man who knows who he is, the only thing that will satisfy him is to be the one in charge. Black must once again become synonymous with ruler. It was our identity once. It must be again. But this future won't bring itself into being. We must make it real. To rule the world again, we must decide that we are going to be rulers and not servants. We must have not just a thirst for power, but an unquenchable hunger for it. We must be all-consuming in our desire for power, and we will know when we are when we begin to take control of the resources and the means of production. Swag is not a commodity. It is not valuable. As black people, we have created things the world wants, but nothing the world needs. We control nothing, and as a result, we have nothing. This must change. We require big ideas and the pragmatism to make them real. We must start tackling the very real problems we face, because the only way to put an end to the threat white supremacy poses to the world is to put an end to white power itself. And a weak, willfully subservient, confused people cannot do that. But no one man can acquire power on his own either, and no one man alone can hold it. This will require a nation of men working together. Black authority told you power is exclusive. I'm a firm believer in aggregating power. I'm also a firm believer that power is not inclusive, power is exclusive. So I'm not scared of small numbers, so long as the small numbers are powerful and brought enough resources to inflict their will. And once we start putting something into place, other people are going to gravitate to that. But they can't gravitate to what you don't have. When we keep inviting whites, Asians, Hispanics, and everyone else into our ventures, we are sabotaging ourselves. We must not merely want to have an all-black club. We must also realize that we have to keep others out. Because non-blacks are not going to put our interests before their own. And the black man being in charge is not in their interests. The question is, is it in yours? We must show respect for ourselves and for each other. Black people who still engage in ghetto talk, ghetto behavior, ghetto mannerisms, ghetto mentality are garbage to be cast off. We must have a zero-tolerance policy for those who still wish to act like children. We will regain power when we relearn to unite with one another. Look in the mirror and relearn how to love what you see. Look at your black brethren in sorority and love what you see. Embrace knowledge, because that was the black man's first and most important gift to the world. Black first isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's the only good thing this sorry world has left. The black man has the power to change the world. He's done so countless times in the past. But first, he must change himself. Black people have to supply to one another what we need. Black businessmen to employ us and give us economic strength. Black carpenters and masons to build black homes and buildings. Black teachers to educate our children properly. Black policemen to secure our neighborhoods. Black artists to maintain our culture and not perpetuate mental perversions handed to us by white people. Everything in this current society has been perverted into a tool of white supremacy. Even the things you think are for black people are actually white tools in disguise. We need a true African culture that can act as a shield against this. Even in our weakened and ignorant state, we've still managed to have a huge impact on the world. Imagine how much more power we would have if we stopped being white people's puppets. Right now we are content to be employee of the month instead of chairman of the board. We must come to see this for what it is laziness. It's easier to put in an eight-hour day instead of an 80-hour week, but this is self-deception. Yes, being the boss is more work, but it's also a lot more power. We've practiced how to settle for less, and now we're losing everything.
As black people, we've made it a habit to poor-mouth each other. The most vicious boycott in the world is not the one the Asians have against us, it's the one we have against ourselves. We refuse to do business with one another, and we've convinced ourselves that this self-hating, self-defeating behavior is somehow cute. To us, we think if we spend money with each other, that that's money wasted. Let me tell you something. Spending money with your people is never a waste of money. Buying hair weave from Koreans who happily mistreat us is money wasted. And if you're buying from white people, you might as well get a gun and shoot the first black person you meet. Our economic philosophy must be black first. Commitment to black people begins with you. How committed are you to your people? Do you make it a point to buy from your people whenever possible, even if you have to keep going out of your way to do so? Or do you take the easy way out and blame black merchants for not being convenient enough, not cheap enough, or their goods not being of high enough quality? Do you seek out black businesses to spend money with? Or do you only buy from black businesses when you have no other choice? As human beings, we are creatures of habit, and we've made it a habit to avoid dealing with one another. This has bred mistrust and contempt. We are strangers to one another. This must change. I'm telling you right now, you better make up your minds how you're going to go about being a people. You have to live your lives as black people because you can't be anything else. How you treat other black people, how you regard them, is a direct reflection of how you regard yourself. Our people deserve the best, and we have the ability to give it to them. All that's missing is the will. Our focus is on trivial toys and stupid diversions. It's time to get serious. As black people, our manufactured goods must be of the highest quality. We must make textile clothing to be the best. If we're farmers, our food must be the best. If we make art, our literature must be the best. Our music, the best. Our movies representing the most intelligent and profound of creative statements. No more ghetto literature. No more urban soap operas. The only stories our so-called writers come up with are all about stupid people having dating problems. We've fallen in love with our dysfunctions, and the creative works we produce show this. But the sad truth is we cannot have a society that is smarter or more aspirational than the people in it. And by and large, most black people today are willfully ignorant. So the first step to change is to embrace the very values we've spent 50 years rejecting and to drop these petty bad habits once and for all. But we don't have many black people who can create the kind of works that we need. And worse than that, we don't have many black people interested in such work. Our people want to obsess over relationship drama, especially our women. This is childish and regressive. Figuring out how to navigate the dating scene is supposed to be something you figure out in your teens, not something you obsess over from cradle to grave. But having failed to create businesses, the only power we have is to screw up our own lives and those around us, so we fixate on that. We don't challenge anything important. We don't say anything worth hearing. Our people deserve better than this. Rather than tell our writers to create better work, I am challenging black audiences to seek out better work and to not buy inferior work. It is time for us to put in a new boycott, this time against the subgenre of petty relationship drama. The only conversation that is relevant for the intelligent black man today is how to control everything around him and how to use it to gain even more power. No other conversation is relevant. And this perpetual grasping for power must be the topic of conversation whenever black men meet. It must dominate our thinking, pushing out all other trivial diversions. If the morning FM show you listen to is still talking about relationships and celebrity gossip, don't turn it down, turn it off. You'd be better off watching endless repeats of John Henry Clark's lectures than listening to the newest story about Kanye and Kim.
If the TV show you're watching isn't about how you can empower yourself, turn it off and keep it off. If the black people around you aren't talking about power, get away from them and find some black people who are. We must have a zero tolerance policy for all immature foolishness. And that begins with your own personal life. Everything in our lives, from the way we make our money to the entertainment we watch, must be a tool of our empowerment. Nobody else on the planet wastes time with things that don't empower them except us. Anything you are interested in, you are supposed to own a piece of. Do you like cars? Then you should own a car company. Do you like books? Then you should be a book publisher, or at the least, a writer. Do you like sports? Then you should own a sports team. It is time out for us to beat customers. From now on, a black man must be an owner. The media is the defining force in global culture today, and we don't have any media real estate. We have black front men like Bob Johnson and puppets like Puff Daddy who are mouthpieces for the white media interests who own them. And what kind of media are they pushing? More rap videos and comedy shows. Because we don't have enough of those. Enough with black people being on the media chitlin circuit. If you don't own the company that makes the things you like, at the very least own a piece of that company. Do not patronize any business you do not own, or who isn't working in your direct interest. You better start putting everything in this world, and I do mean every single thing, into one of two categories, either tools to serve our power or impediments to that power. This includes business, politics, real estate, people, consumer goods, religion, media, everything. We are at war for our survival, and it is a war we are losing. Many of you didn't believe or understand when I said it before, but I'll bet my words are a little better understood now. In a war, you have to choose targets. These are things to be captured or destroyed. The whites have waged economic war on us, targeting black neighborhoods for destruction, and now entire black cities. They target our businesses for takeover, and the ones they cannot take over, they use laws that they wrote to undermine them and run them out of business. This is the mentality we must have. Choose some targets for takeover or destruction. The reason the Supreme Court stomps on our rights is because they know we don't have any people in Congress who will throw them off the bench for political high-handedness. Which, by the way, is exactly what Scalia admitted to when he announced to the world that he looked forward to legislating from the bench, since it would save his political buddies' jobs. Scalia should be off the court and on his way to an indictment. If we had 10 or 20 senators on our payroll, he would be. There's a reason why, even when blacks are the majority in a city, their politicians still do the white people's bidding anyway. Because the whites bought them. Blacks don't need to be the majority to ensure we get what's ours, but we do have to realize that money talks. So far, we have chosen to be silent, especially with each other. This must change. As I said in R.I.P. Black America, if we fight, we win. If we don't, we die. The problem is we haven't been fighting at all. The first step is we must have a gathering of eagles. The Internet is a nice place to find like-minded people, but have you ever noticed that when white people and Asians find each other on the Internet, they immediately arrange a meeting offline? Take a look at Wong Fu Productions, for example. When they saw they couldn't get the white studios to back Asian films because the studios said the Asian audience was too small, they decided to build that audience themselves by going across the U.S. and Canada to the one place they knew they'd find Asian people, college campuses. Doing this, they have now created a map with a network of contacts. They know where their people are and how to reach them, and both the Internet and Hollywood are taking notice. You know, that used to be us during the 60s and 70s. Using the same networking tactics developed during the civil rights struggle, black filmmakers like Melvin Van Peebles got the word out to their people and found a way to circumvent the whites' only policies of Hollywood. Black exploitation should have given way to major black-owned studios. Instead, it gave way to Tyler Perry. Intelligent black America needs to begin networking now. 
if you talk with an intelligent black person online, the next move is to meet them in person. We don't need everyone to get on board with this agenda. In fact, we must accept that fully one half of our people simply are not with us, and, and truth be told, aren't even worth saving. Hell, even if everyone were on board, as weak and disorganized as we are right now, we simply don't have the strength to save everyone. It will be all we can do to save the strongest among us. We have neither the time nor should we have the desire to save the worthless. Let the dead bury the dead. In my video, Black Face in White and Yellow, I challenged you by asking what are you going to do about it. Many people thought it cute to say that they would do nothing because they didn't see it as a problem. Now that white supremacy is once again on the march, I relish seeing these fools sit on their hands until their white buddies do them in. But understand that intelligent black society will also suffer the same fate unless we make the deliberate choice to rely on each other and on each other alone. I trust you understand now what I meant when I said that we are all Detroiters now. So, what are you going to do about it?